Hi, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Banshi Sabu, for giving me the opportunity to speak uh, for this diabetes care conference. Today, we are going to talk about uh, physical inactivity. Now, as a diabetes practitioner, we all know that physical exercise is one of the most important uh, treatment modalities of diabetes treatment but equally true is that just by not doing the physical activity it can be extremely harmful to our body that's why this is the plan to talk about sedentary lifestyle and how it causes progresses and blocks the treatment for diabetes there is something called as disuse syndrome which means sedentary lifestyle causing the medical problems. It's a serious worldwide problem and it has progressively increased over past many decades. Humans are basically not programmed for physically being inactive. Uh, for hundreds of thousands of years, the humanity has been extremely physically active, which has recently changed and not surprisingly coincided with the explosion of obesity and diabetes. In fact, there is a term called a sedentary death syndrome because of the premature deaths that would not have happened if the people were active. In the United States, about two thirds of the major causes of death are related to the lifestyle. And the author of this article actually prefers to label the cause of death as physical inactivity and poor nutrition. About 15% of newly diagnosed chronic diseases you can directly attribute to the sedentary lifestyle. This is a list of all the complicated things that happen because of physical inactivity. We are going to talk mainly about the obesity and diabetes. So obesity first because it's a precursor of most of the type 2 diabetes and it's a direct consequence of physical inactivity. Now, diet also plays a major role on it, but that role is superimposed on the uh, level of your physical exercise. So how it is compounded by the excess diet? So people eating less, medium and more can have a variable outcome for obesity based on how much are they exercising. So graphically, if you put it, there is a caloric intake from 1200 to 2800. And if the person is physically very, very active, then as they eat more, they gain weight, but the slope of that weight gain is not so pronounced. If you are working out less, you gain more weight for the same amount of eating. And if you work less, the progression goes up. But if you go low beyond a certain point that is almost sedentary level, the weight gain is very disproportionate. And even if these people are in the range of 1800 calories, you will find profound weight gain just by physical inactivity. So I dare to say that obesity is a direct consequence of physical inactivity. Now there are multiple scenarios in which one is person is absolutely inactive if they eat just enough, like not too much, not too little, then there is still progressive slow weight gain. And we all know that from the age of 18 to 40, we invariably weight gain because even if we do not overeat. Now, this thing gets worse if, uh, sorry, if you restrict the diet and no exercise, like typically the malnourished individual, you do get weight, stable weight or the weight loss, but uh, there is a significant muscle loss associated with it. Now, if you do the prescribed exercise and um, use the mindful diet, and I will talk about how much prescribed at the end, then you get the stable mass, weight with the uh, stable mass preserved. However, these are the uh, uh, re relatively rare scenarios when you are doing intense exercise like an athlete, they can eat a lot and they can still have a stable weight. But if you eat extremely high amount of diet, 
even with the intense exercise, which is a very rare case, such as a sumo wrestler, where they eat 10,000 calories and they gain weight in spite of exercise. So that's how you cannot talk in one dimension. You have to have a correlation of it, but for a given amount of diet, the exercise matters how much you will gain weight. And this is how it works physiologically. So if I eat the meal, there is a lot of calories coming in in a very short period of time and immediately they are saved in the liver as a glycogen about 75 grams and then a big bunch is stored in the muscle. Now this is reversible, it is utilized in between the meals to do our daily activities and by the time I eat my next meal, if I use most of the stored energy, then there is not much energy left to gain the weight or increase the body fat. This part is ex um, accentuated by exercise where you can make sure complete utilization of what you ate. Now, if you eat more and more means in relation to exercise, then by the uh, end of this utilization, you still are left with some more energy which is stored in excess by the time you are ready for next meal. And when you take the next meal, those two are added and you have extra energy by the time you eat next and the stacking keeps on going on. So that stacking eventually leads to the uh, fat storage. Now, if you either delay the meal, which is basis of the intermittent fasting, or if you exercise, then this fat deposition can be significantly reduced. Now, if you are lean, then you can gain weight by lack of physical activity because the food is not being utilized. On top of it, if you eat a lot more, then you can gain weight much faster. When you try to do the opposite, when you are obese to begin with and try to lose weight, we know that it can be done quickly by calorie reduction. But we also know that it is a J-shaped curve where the initial weight loss invariably is associated with a progressive weight gain unless it is added with physical activity. So uh, studies after studies have shown that the only way to stabilize the initial weight loss is by physical activity. Moving on to type 2 diabetes, we all know that insulin resistance is at the basis of type 2 diabetes. A smaller component comes from the hereditary, but the bigger component comes from the lack of exercise and abdominal obesity, which is consequence of lack of exercise and overeating. We all know this slide, so I'm going to skip because everybody knows the natural history. But how physical activity affects insulin resistance? There are two ways. One is the immediate effect. And that is happening by activation of glucose transporters. This lasts for about 24 to 48 hours. And we all know as a practitioner that a patient on the insulin and sulfonylurea, when they exercise, there is an immediate hypoglycemia within a few hours, which is mediated by the uh, improving insulin sensitivity. And the long-term effect, when you have a habitual exercise, chronic exercise, that improves the muscle fat ratio, which improves the insulin resistance, and also mitochondrial hypertrophy, which improves the energy utilization. It's very important that interval period between the two meals, if we utilize all the energy, then the liver is not studied with fat. But if you have a chronic excess of the diet, in relation to no spending or no draining of the fat, we eventually get the NASH, which is hepatocellular fat and also the intramyocellular fat. Both of these ectopic fat deposition are associated with intense insulin resistance. One of the dreaded side effects of physical inactivity is sarcopenia. The loss of muscle mass always accompanies aging. Multiple reasons, one is a re, uh, stem cell depletion, decrease in anabolic hormones, but also the diminished physical activity with age. 
the muscle strength decreases approximately 50% from age 30 to 80 years. Exercise not only reverses this age-associated decline, but it also gains the muscle strength. In one study, after 12 weeks of exercise training, about 40% of the loss and uh, strength loss and 75% of the mass was restored. Now, how old is old for not to exercise? The answer is no. Even at the age of 90 years of age, the progressive resistance training shows similar or even greater gains compared with the young individuals. And then there are multiple studies on that. The 12 weeks in the older men, exercise strength in flex extensor doubled, flexor tripled, and the total muscle inc mass increased. Even in the frail individuals, if you do the eight weeks of high intensity training, the strength increases, and that has a positive effect on diabetes. Everybody knows diabetes prevention trials, so I'm not going into the details, but basically the lifestyle intervention was as good as metformin. It was not bettered by metformin also. So no question about physical activity as a part of diabetes. So how much activity is good? The guidelines comes coming from the College of Sports Medicine and Heart Association, which tell us that moderate intensity of aerobic activity, which requires walking, speed walking or little jogging, and aerobic activity about minimum 30 minutes for five days a week. It can also be said one hour for three days a week, which basically means 300 minutes of moderate intense activity spread over the week. Or if you have a vigorous intense activity, which is sprinting or tennis or badminton or fast uh, biking, that involves even minimum 20 minutes, three days a week. So it's not a lot. It's really not a lot, but not doing that small part itself can be detrimental. The recommendation for the minutes is similar to the older adults, but the intensity you can modify depending on the baseline strength. And compared with the inactive group, those who exercise even 15 minutes per day had 14% reduced risk of all cause of mortality and three year life expectancy. So it is very, very powerful. So each additional 15 minutes further reduced all cause mortality by 4% and cancer mortality by 1%. So basically, my thoughts on the take home points here are um, lack of physical activity is the most powerful root cause of morbidity and mortality. The physical activity is one of the most essential component of healthy life. So we should not consider it as a um, uh, option or a good thing to do, but it is an essential, absolutely important thing to do. No health or the weight loss program can be serious if it does not include structured and monitored physical activity. Again, I'm saying that diet is equally important, but diet alone always fails. It has to be combined with physical activity. So if you get a program of any kind of diet or it, uh, um, beach, South Beach diet or Atkins diet or any other diet, if it is not included uh, equal or serious uh, importance to the physical activity, then I don't think the program is very serious. It's not a course. It's not a 90 days lose 30 pounds. It is a lifestyle. It is something that you need to do every day or routinely. So for our doctors, if the work hours do not give us any inbuilt time for exercise, because there are many other uh, workplaces like bus conductor, for example, they are always on the feet and walking. We physicians or computer technologists or many researchers, they are having a sedentary work, which means does not give exercise at work. They have to find time for the physical activity after the work hours to be healthy. And the most important part, if you do not find time for exercise today, you will have to find a lot more time for doctor's visit tomorrow. Thank you so much for your time.